Hello, hello, and welcome to a Beatles program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a show in which we talk about all things Beatles. Could be any part of their past, any part of their history, or could be something in the news. I'm Ken Michaels. Some of you might know me for my other Beatles program called Every Little Thing. And I'm being joined by my regular co-host, that being Steve Marinucci, who writes for many Examiner columns, especially the one we're most familiar with, which is Beatles Examiner. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. And we are bringing along our new co-host of the show, whom we introduced last week here on the program. We have Al Sussman from Beatle Fan Magazine. Hi, Al. Hi, Ken. How are you? And Alan Cozen, who writes for Beatle Fan as well, and also is culture reporter, culture reporter for the New York Times. Hi, Alan. Hello, everybody. Hello, Ken. Before we start the show, there's already a little bit of a change in the program, and that is that Robert Rodriguez, who was one of the co-hosts in our first show, has uh, informed us because of another opportunity that has come along that he can't be a part of this show. And actually, with all that we were talking about on our last program, when we were introducing ourselves, we couldn't tell you all everything about ourselves. One of the things that we didn't get to say was that Robert also does another podcast with Richard Buskin, who has authored a Beatle book recently, Beatles 101, and it's called Something About the Beatles. And because of opportunities that have come along with that show, um, he won't be able to do this show. So we are a work in progress. We may get a fifth member to the show. We may have a a rotating member. We don't really know for sure. We're just seeing, we're feeling our way out in the very beginning of the show as this group. But uh, we wish Robert only the best, and we're very happy for him. And best of luck with Robert and Richard with their show called Something About the Beatles. Indeed. Yep. All right, so... um, We are going to talk about something that's in the news right now, and just last week on November the 20th, I think it was, was the release date for the album called The Art of McCartney, and this has been getting a lot of attention lately. It is a tribute to Paul and its various artists, most of whom are veterans, and you can call them icons as well, uh, with some independent artists too. They're all covering music from Paul's career. Uh, from his Beatle years and also his solo career. And uh, there's a lot of great artists on here, like Billy Joel. And um, let's see, you've got Brian Wilson, Cat Stevens, Steve Miller, Hart. So many great people. Legends like Dion DiMucci's on here, Smokey Robinson. And uh, I thought we'd all share our feelings, what we think about this particular release. So who would like to start first? Okay. Why don't we... Uh, why don't we... Do Alan's and Steve first because I did a review last night for uh, for Beatle fans, so I've got a lot to say. So I'll I'll bounce off what their uh, what their thoughts are. Why don't we start with you, Alan? Okay, you know I have actually sort of a strange relationship with cover versions of Beatles things. For until very recently, actually, I didn't pay any attention to them at all. I often got them and put them on the shelf. Um, but I wasn't that interested in them. Um, and probably what changed it was, was the Smithereens version of Meet the Beatles a few years ago. I, I kind of liked the idea that it wasn't a slavish reproduction of Beatles stuff, and it was. And I liked the Smithereens, so maybe that's why. And uh, and and at the time, I, I wrote a piece for the Times about this whole business of, of cover bands, Beatles cover bands, and tribute bands, and. And um, I, I had sort of a, a weird philosophical problem with the whole thing and my reaction to it, which was that um, I was completely ignoring cover bands as being sort of, you know, not worth the trouble. And yet the other side of my life as a classical music critic, I was going out night after night and hearing string quartets play Haydn quartets from the music exactly the way it had been since Haydn wrote them. So um, I was trying to reconcile these things. And lately, um, you know, for various reasons, I started collecting cover versions and listening to them. And so this came out in a way at just the right time. It seemed to me, you know, in prospect before hearing any of it, that for one thing, they have an incredible roster of people. And you would think that, uh, you know, just as tribute 
albums go, you know, you couldn't come up with a better bunch of interpreters, a more varied bunch of interpreters. And I also had thought that having McCartney's stage as the essential backing band was in theory a good idea because when they back McCartney, they really rock and they know the arrangements cold and all of that. In practice, what I found is that all of those things that I thought might really be good about this were not necessarily good about it. It kind of bothered me that most of these, or or certainly well over 50% of these interpretations were really not interpretations at all. They were just straightforward renderings of the songs with pretty much the arrangements that McCartney or the Beatles used. And the things that I found most interesting were the ones that departed from that. So, for instance, B.B. King's On The Way, I mm. thought was great because it sounded like a B.B. King track, not a slavish cover of a Paul McCartney song. Um, Dylan sings we said today. I'm not sure how I feel about it. <laughs> I mean, as with, with a lot of recent Dylan things, it kind of takes a while to either either come around to it or not. Uh, but it's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, the Billy Joel things were pretty much just straightforward. Uh, heart tracks were straightforward, but I, I, I thought they had some personality. The Steve Miller tracks I thought were okay. Um, Brian Wilson's Wanderlust was lovely. Um, disappointed with the Kiss track because it was just, you know, there was nothing about it that was particularly Kiss, you know, it was just a straightforward cover. And uh, and the same with Alice Cooper, you know. I kind of expect something more unusual when Alice Cooper does something. And his version of Eleanor Rigby was, you know, he might have just been an anonymous singer singing to the string backing. So that that basically is my feeling about the, the whole thing in a nutshell. Wow. I mean, I could certainly um, agree with just about everything you said there, Alan. Uh, Steve, do you want to give your point of view or or should i no uh, well i'll go, I'll go ahead um I, I i've been a big fan of cover versions as opposed to tribute albums i have a big collection of cover versions so individual cover a lot i i used to go looking for individual cover songs on on albums and some of them are really really good and then there are full albums some of them are really good and some of them are are really awful. Um, I'm thinking of the one, um, the uh, organist, from, uh, Dutch organist who did the uh, Beatles songs uh, like uh, E-Power Biggs. Um, Alan, have you heard that one? No. Oh, yeah. No. Oh, it's it's hilarious. It was actually E-Power Biggs? No, no, no. It's The guy's uh -oh. name is, I'd have to, I'd, I, I don't want to take time during, the, during this and look it up. His last name is Van Dyke. If you look on, Look on YouTube. There's a, a one of the tracks where he does um, the Abbey Road medley is on there, and it's absolutely wonderful to listen to. It's hilarious. It's hilarious because uh, he does it very straight, and like I said, it's like E Power Big doing the Beatles, and that those type of weird things. I mean, there's some there's some great examples of that, you know, down the line. So, and and you're right with the lineup here. You know, I uh, I was really looking forward to what was going to happen, and I figured everybody would add their own little mark, and everybody would would do you know would would I mean each track would be very ind individualistic, but it it really wasn't, and I was very very disappointed in this thing for two reasons. Number one, for what you said, and and because when I I heard the stream, um, I got the stream in advance. And I just couldn't believe how many of these songs followed the original arrangements, almost note for note, without any mm -hmm. character at all. Um, I actually liked the Billy Joel stuff um, because Billy Joel had uh, had some really good vocals. So even though they did follow the uh, arrangements, I thought the the Bob Dylan thing was funny. I actually thought, uh, had uh, laughed a little bit when I heard that. I thought the Steve Miller things were good because they it sounded they had a real retro sound to them. I thought Wonderlust by Brian Wilson was wonderful, and I, as I, as the BB King song was, which you mentioned, I thought that was that was stunning. And I, I actually liked the Roger Daltrey Helter Skelter, which I also thought was really good. You almost could see Roger swinging the microphone doing that one. 
But the mo- most of the album was just really disappointing. It, it was just really there really wasn't any purpose on any of the tracks. And the other thing that really bothered me was the fact that you had to buy five different versions to get all the tracks or spend big bucks to get the deluxe version, which I really thought was unfair. I mean, it, it, we're just talking a tribute album. We're not talking a, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I agree that there were some great people on here, but there was absolutely no reason to make people pay all that money to get all of the tracks. That was that was uncalled for completely. So if I had to give this a, a grade, I think I'm going to have to give it like a, a C. Um, I mean, it's not horrible, and if you're a McCartney fan, you'll obviously love it, but I just really, I was very disappointed. I thought the hype did not equal the the end product. So hmm. there, you, there you go. Okay. So, Al, do you want to Ken, why don't you Ken, why don't you go ahead and give your okay, and I'll do a mine. lot of yeah, a lot of things I'd love to say about this. First of all, on the subject of cover versions in general, a long time ago when I first started out, I had no interest whatsoever in cover versions because I thought. What could compare to the originals, whether it's Beatles or the solo? So, um, but that changed over time, and, it, and many years back already, I started to really love cover versions, especially when artists do their own arrangements, to the point where, like, my favorite Beatle cover is Earth, Wind, and Fire doing Got to Get You Into My Life. So, yeah, those kind of things, when Stevie Wonder did We Can Work It Out, he put his own spin on it. I always loved Sergio Mendez doing Fool on the Hill. When it's something that's a different arrangement and they kind of make it their own, that takes a certain talent to itself. And at the same time, I also appreciate when artists really study the detail of Beatles or solo Beatle recordings, if they can really nail it. I appreciate both sides there. I like the extremes. I like when an artist can do exactly what, what the Beatles or, or the original artist does and really studies it because that takes a talent to itself. And then I like the opposite end when they do their own arrangements. But the ones that stay with me the most tend to be the ones that are their own arrangements. I think the best moments on this CD are, uh, like you were saying, you were both, um, Steve and, and Alan on the way from BB King. Uh, I love Smokey Robinson's recording of So Bad. Because, um, you know, he's still one of the greatest singers of all time. And when it comes to ballads, you know, he's one of those people that could really do it justice. And when I first heard he was going to cover So Bad, I already heard it in my head. You know, it's one of those songs that I just feel was tailor-made for Smokey Robinson. I love Brian Wilson doing Wanderlust. I thought that was terrific. One of the benefits of, of this particular collection is that there are certain songs there that aren't normally covered. You know, when you're talking about Paul's career, we have gotten tons and tons of Beatle covers. When it comes to the solo music, it's very limiting. Um, there have been some McCartney compilations that have come out through the years. Not many, but usually they tend to be the well-known McCartney Beatle songs that are covered and the biggest hits from his solo career. And certainly there's plenty of that on here. But the fact that anybody covered Wanderlust, I mean, that to me, it's a great song from Tug of War. It's being acknowledged here. There are certain songs that were hits, that were singles, that radio has completely abandoned now, like Helen Wheels, like Venus and Mars Rock Show. I love the fact that any artists are attempting to do that because it's acknowledging those songs. It's giving them the attention that they deserve. Mm-hmm. You know, high, high, high being covered here. You know, when those songs are covered, I really appreciate that because it's going a little bit deeper into McCartney's catalog. I like um, the reggae version of Come and Get It oh, yeah. from uh, Toots Hibbert and Sly and Robbie. Um, what else? I like um, what Hart did with Letting Go. It wasn't that different from McCartney's version, but it was more the Wings Over America version when they added Do You Feel Like Letting Go? So it gave that kind of a feel to it. And contrary to what you were saying, Alan, I happen to like Kiss's version of Venus and Mars Rock Show. What I appreciate about it is that they even do the coda of the song. You know, <laughs> okay. They remembered the entire recording, whereas Paul, during the Wings Over America tour, he went right into Jet. He cut that part off. Mm-hmm. And even in recent years, when he, when he brought back Venus and Mars Rock Show, it was really uh, the shorter version, like the single version of the song. You know, a song like Junk, which has gotten some recognition, 
just like the fact that Jeff Lynn covered it. And like you said, Steve, Helter Skelter, Roger Daltrey, perfect pairing. You know, that's, mm-hmm. that's really made for Roger's voice. So, um, and I do like Cat Stevens doing The Long and Winding Road. You know, I, I love his voice. It's got a deep, rich tone to it with some age now, but it really fit that particular particular song. But what I, I think where the album suffers, and I hate to say this because I like Paul's backing band, but I think we don't really know for sure because I haven't read or have heard an interview with Ralph Sal, who's the producer for this uh, tribute. But for all we know, the band could have just went into the studio over a couple of days and just did their backing tracks, and then all these other artists came in and did their vocals. It would have been a lot more interesting if these artists had their own musicians and they did their own arrangements and put their own spin on these songs. It kind of feels like so many of these songs that Paul's backing band, his live band, the ones that they're on, are songs that Paul does live anyway. So it's basically the backing tracks for what Paul does live with different vocalists. So, you know, it really, when you have the artists injecting more of themselves into the song, you know, I really appreciate that. First of all, this is like a bonus track on on uh, the deluxe version, but the fact that Alice Cooper does Smile Away, that's another song that isn't recognized as much. I love it as a rocker. But that goes uh, along with what I was saying about songs that are lesser known, and I love the fact that um, certain artists are doing that too. But um, And one other thing that really disturbs me about this collection is that when you do have Paul's backing band and you've got certain really great artists who shine on their own instruments, they're not being given a chance to do that. And in particular, Junior's Farm from Steve Miller. Junior's Farm, by the way, is a song that I don't know if you guys have ever felt this as I do, but I've always associated that song with Steve Miller in the first place because Rockin' Me came out in 1973. And it's got a similar feel to it. It's got that, that bass line, those 16th notes. And Junior's Farm is very much in the same vein. And then Steve Miller came out with Jet Airliner, which is kind of similar to Rockin' Me, but they're similar in style. And, you know, all artists listen to each other. And Paul is friends with Steve Miller anyway. But um, I've always kind of connected Junior's Farm with Steve Miller. But there's someone that's a great guitar player, and he's not doing the guitar solo on the song and it's Paul's band that's that's doing it. And I mean it's um it's Rusty Anderson I believe that does the lead guitar solo. Mm-hmm. Not to take away anything away from Rusty, but you have Steve Miller here. <laughs> you know, he's the one that should be doing a guitar solo on there. Uh likewise with with Billy Joel on uh, Live and Let Die. Why isn't he playing the piano on Live and Let Die? I mean, I I guess we should be grateful that BB King is playing the guitar and on the way. <laughs> But, uh, you know, if you've got an artist who's really a great musician and excels at his instrument and is known for his instrument, that person should be allowed to do more than strictly sing on the song. Right. So there's a lot of good things and bad things about this compilation. But you anyway, know what I found sort of, yeah. one thing I found kind of interesting was, um, you know, Willie Nelson doing Yesterday. Mm-hmm. How many people have done yesterday, for God's sake? You know, yesterday, it had to be there. You couldn't have a McCartney tribute album without it. And I think Willie Nelson was actually a really good choice because mm-hmm. cause Willie Nelson sounds like Willie Nelson and can only mm-hmm. sound like Willie Nelson and can phrase like Willie Nelson. And that that version to me just seems, you know, okay, this is a bit different. It's, you know, especially coming after so many sort of cookie-cutter versions um, on, of people just doing it straight. Um, of course, right. it is a couple of tracks after after Brian Wilson's Wanderlust, which was lovely. But, um, you know, I, I thought that was a highlight. And as a low light, did, what did anybody make of Chrissy Hine? Uh, surprisingly very annoying. <laughs> yeah. You yeah, know, I found, hmm. that, you know, that very mannered, this, you know, airy words, right, it, you know, and every single time, it, it just seems so bizarre, unlistenable. I don't know why she, she used that approach at all. And she's one of my absolute favorite female singers, you know, one of the greatest female rock singers to me. So I was looking forward to hearing her version of Let It Be, but that was a disappointment for me. 
it was almost like she was trying to sing it the way she thought people would want Chrissy Hine to sing it. Maybe. See, now, I, I now, I, now, I like that. That's one of the ones I actually thought was, was really good. So you can mm. you can go from there. Oh, by but, the way, one more thing. A, a very interesting version on this album is No More Lonely Nights, which comes right. from the Airborne Toxic Event, which is an independent band. I think they're based out of L.A. And it's mainly an acoustic version with strings. So, again, there's, the, there's an example of a, a different arrangement, and it really works. So, you know, there's, there's this cross between a few unique arrangements and ones where the artist puts their own spin and maybe because of a voice like Smokey Robinson kind of makes it their own, helps to make it their own. And then you've got the ones that are just really faithful to the originals, but they lack something because they don't put enough of themselves into it. All these artists are so worthy of being heard of themselves with their own musicians doing these versions, and it would have been far more interesting if, if that was the case. So those are my feelings. Al, how about well, you? Well, matter of fact, uh, over the weekend I watched the, the DVD that comes with the deluxe version of the album. And, in fact, it answers a few of the questions that we that we posed. Uh, Willie Nelson apparently has done yesterday extensively in concert over the years. So that's probably why his version is so effective, because basically it's just him on that weather-beaten old guitar of his and with Rusty Anderson providing some, you know, a little bit of backing on acoustic guitar and... Uh, one of Willie's, uh, one of Willie's band, one of the members of Willie's band on harmonica, and that's basically uh, basically it. Uh, the Steve Miller track, the Junior's Farm, uh, Ralph Saul, because there is an extensive interview with Ralph Saul on the uh, on the DVD, and he indeed did pick Junior's Farm with Steve Miller in mind, specific and mentioned specifically things like Jet Airliner and Rockin' Me. As, oh. as as being in that in that vein, uh, and yes, he did confirm that basically Paul's band went into the studio and laid down. I, I guess I think they're on a little more than half of the uh, the tracks, the 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 full forty two tracks. Mm-hmm. I think they're on about a little over half of those, and right. they they did indeed go in and basically do the backgrounds on those tracks and then the individual artists most of them went into the studio and just simply sang to those backing tracks and that's the problem that's the problem with this album because in fact it, it's funny because it's all uh it's the fact that paul's band was utilized so much on here indicates that it was in a sense that was uh, almost a self or uh, semi semi authorized tribute album that basically Paul allowing his band to go in and provide the the background on so many of the tracks kind of imita- uh, indicates that uh, he may have given his sort of tacit blessing to this whole project even though there's no actual con- you know confirmation of that but the problem with that is is that it is that on those tracks, especially uh, on those songs that Paul does regularly in concert, and, and certainly all of us, we've all seen Paul any number of times with this band over the last 13 years. Mm-hmm. And the problem is that you hear the, the backing tracks on those particular songs, and you're almost half expecting to hear Paul sing them. Mm-hmm. And instead you get Billy Joel or Hart or, you know, whoever. And so there's almost like a karaoke quality <laughs> to some of those to some of those tracks. I was actually I was very disappointed in the two Billy Joel tracks because I just felt that he was being too too restrained and also he was trying to sing and certainly was trying to sing Maybe I'm Amazed. I think in too high a register because he just he seemed to be straining his voice, right? And um, and and he just seemed to be trying to go as close to the McCartney 
the, the, the McCartney playbook for, the, for those two songs as possible. Now, Hart, actually, I thought Hart uh, did, a, did a better job on, on their two tracks. You know, they did bring a little bit more of their, you know, the sort of the Hart sound uh, to those tracks. But, for instance, I mean, the, the, the two tracks that um, – or the one track – that um, uh, Robinson Ander and, and Rick Nielsen did um, mm-hmm. on Jet, I thought was just, you know, really ordinary. Uh, same with Sammy Hagar doing Birthday. Helter Skelter was good, but, you know, I can't help thinking that, you know, 35 or 40 years ago, Roger would have killed that. But, you know, his, his voice is not, is not what it was. Um, and the, yeah, the, the, the Venus and Mars rock show by Kiss, it, yeah, it's kind of tailor made for them because it has that kind of, uh, you know, uh, rock show spectacular type of, uh, type of theme to it. So it lends itself maybe more to the, the Kiss sound, even though, uh, well, actually on that particular track, it is really more of a, of a Kiss track than a McCartney band track. But I, but some of the some of the the selection, some of the pairings, some of the song pairings are really strange. Like uh Dion doing Drive My Car. Mm-hmm. When when I first heard it, I thought I, you know I'm I'm thinking I could think of like 20 songs, 20 different McCartney songs or Beatles songs that would be more within Dion's musical wheelhouse, and yet look at the DVD, and Dion's on there saying that he selected "Drive My Car" and that he had the basically the um, uh, it had it kind of slowed down into a, a shuffle beat with a lot of cowbell, and he you know he he liked it that way. Uh, obviously, the Steve Miller "Hey Jude," I mean anybody's version of Hey Jude is going to is going to suffer by comparison to almost any McCartney version but certainly you know Junior's Farm actually worked kind of well I thought the two the two New Orleans uh, artists Alan Toussaint and uh, Dr. John were wasted on the two tracks they did because you know basically Lady Madonna and Let Him In were basically just simply you know the live McCartney versions of those songs, and there's no real New Orleans flavor to them. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, but don't mm-hmm. you think Dr. John, the way that he phrases himself, his vocals, he he kind of gives it a lot of character, and he kind of makes it his own in his own yeah, way. Yeah, but if it, if it, if if his vocal there had been framed with more of a kind of New Orleans flavor to it, mm. I think it would have been better instead of just simply the way the McCartney band does it. Uh, and Alice Cooper doing, doing Eleanor Rigby was just, to me, was just like a total why, you know, it was, it, it, it was really, it was really sterile. I mean, it was, it was very it, sterile. Very, uh, yeah. very sterile. I was, yeah. I was quite, I was quite surprised. And that, and that was one of the first tracks that they previewed from that thing, you know, yeah. and like, and, and you know, to get people excited and you're going, wait a minute, you want people to get excited about this, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's it it was it was strange. It was very strange. Very strange. Now, in contrast, and Ken mentioned this before, um, Smokey. I think the 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 best track on the album, is Smokey Robinson's version of "So Bad." And all the right. funny thing is, on the DVD, he says that he didn't know the song at all until it was you know until it was uh, you know delivered to him. And uh, because, uh, in fact, in the, the one little clip that's been on YouTube, he's really talking about the Beatles doing Motown songs. And but he really didn't know this at all. And absolutely. And plus, you know, I think we've we've kind of known even going back to when Paul did the original version of So Bad in 1983, that he must have had Smokey, Ro- Smokey Robinson in mind. Mm-hmm. You know, and I mean, it just seems tailor made. And the same with uh, the Brian Wilson Wonderlust. It's all, I mean, especially knowing the kind of special relationship that those two men have. You know, they're born two days apart, and you can always tell that there's a particular warmth between them. 
And you could almost think that when Paul wrote the song in the early 80s that maybe he had Brian in mind uh, because, again, he just, you know, absolutely, you know, absolutely knocks it out of the park. Mm. Uh, the, um, the, the use of uh, Islam, Cat Stevens, uh, Long and Winding Road, he brings, you know, just, you know, the, 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 the right amount of kind of world weariness now that he's a little bit older. Uh, Willie's Yesterday Again, the, the reggae Come and Get It, the B.B. King track, things like that. That's, uh, <laughs> those are, and, and also one of the bonus tracks, um, you know, uh, the, the, the various, uh, retail bonus tracks is, is also an absolute, uh, you know, just a great pairing. And that's Ronnie Spector doing P.S. I Love You. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. There's uh, and and also Booker T. Jones doing uh, "Can't Buy Me Love." I thought worked really well. You know that sounds like that that recording of Booker T. Sounds like it could have been done in the '60s. Exactly. It's like, yes. It's like yes. untouched by time. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, that was very interesting in that mm-hmm. regard. And there there are certain people like Ronnie Spector who have such a distinctive voice where just hearing them sing it, they bring something to the song that. I don't want to say make it their own, but they bring a certain identity mm-hmm. to the song, and and it it makes you it it's makes it worth your while to listen to it, even though yeah we're always most of us will say nothing can compare to the original, but she's got such a great voice, and um, you know and it brings a lot to everything that she sings, and especially since that song comes out of that same era, you know that same kind of girl group era. Uh huh. It, mm-hmm. uh, it's it's absolutely tailor made for her kind of a voice. Now, surprisingly, the Darlene Love uh, track, which is also one of the bonus tracks, uh, I thought, and I'm and I'm a huge Darlene Love fan, and I thought that her version of All My Love and was just kind of eh. Hmm. And right. Wanda Jackson doing Run Devil Run. Um, problem there, and again, this you you see this on the DVD is that she was having problems keeping up with the pace of the of the lyrics because she's 70 something years old now and mm-hmm. apparently has you know the breathing problems that a lot of people of that age do and so they had to like you know stop and start almost after every line to be able to get the entire get her you know in good voice on the entire song and i'm not sure how well that worked yeah. Right. Al, mm-hmm. uh, big big question here. Of, of all this material, how much was predetermined for the artist? Uh, Ralph Saul said that um, that some of the songs, you know, that he picked out some of several of the songs, but that it was maybe a maybe an even split between songs that he picked out and songs that they actually uh, requested. You know that that they that they would like to do, like as I said, Dion supposedly said that he wanted to do "Drive My Car," which again I was a mystery to me because I would have uh, you know there are plenty of other songs by Paul or you know uh, from his Beatles catalog that I think would have been you know would have been better suited for somebody who's you know uh, you know bred in the blues and R and B and doo wop. Mm-hmm. You know, you wouldn't think that do that drive my car would be well suited to him, but um, he wanted, and it it's okay. It's not great. I'm wondering with with Wanda Jackson. You know, I think of Wanda because of the Run Devil Run album. One of the mm-hmm. tracks is is Party. Yes, and that's exactly. a song that was uh, you know a hit for her. Right. So maybe she feels connected to the run devil run album right yeah i know i don't know whether that was um whether she picked out that one or whether ralph saul did i don't know he doesn't uh, didn't, didn't say on the dvd mm. but you can tell uh, watching watching the the session tape that she was definitely having problems keeping up with the pace of of the uh you know of the lines because there's a lot of there's a lot of words in each of the lyric lines oh yeah you know, so uh, so she was, you know, she was constantly getting out of breath. Wow. Now, here's a question for all of you. Mm-hmm. When an artist does a faithful version of a cover, whether it's Beatles or whoever, 
Do you appreciate that because it's being respectful of the song and maybe you might feel there's really no other way you can do it? Or do you feel like, you know, you'd, you'd appreciate it more if they did their own arrangement? Because there is a certain talent that does come with studying the song and really getting it down, as any Beatles tribute band would know. Mm -hmm. You know, if you really have the parts down, whether it's guitar, drums, the harmonies, you know, that takes a lot of talent right there. And there are some people who feel respectful that they don't want to stray from that. And I know in this case, you've got Paul's backing band for many of the tracks, so that's mm -hmm. why the songs sound that way. Right. But, you know, do you appreciate more when, when people cover songs, when they try to keep it faithful to the arrangement? I'm not sure. I, 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 I see what you're saying about the, the, the talent involved in recreating those tracks, because especially, I mean, the Beatles stuff during the late Beatle years, the Beatles themselves couldn't do it, you know, mm. live on stage. It, it really required uh, technology and, and conditions that, that they couldn't reproduce on stage. And yet now you get a lot of young bands like Paul's backing band that can play any of that stuff. And you have to admire that. But I think um, as an interpretation, I kind of, if I'm going to hear a cover version of something, I want to hear them do something with it that gives me a reason to want to hear that version instead of just putting on the Beatles version again. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, I kind of feel... Uh, the whole reason for doing stuff like this is, you know, to get another perspective on, on the songs. And that really is not the case on min in many of the songs on this album. And that's what's really disappointing. Yeah, if you've got the backing tracks already laid out, it doesn't give the singer that much room to play with it. You know, you've, you've already got it all structured, and you've got to sing around the way it's already been performed. Mm -hmm. So there's less of the singer or what that singer would want to inject into the song that way. Now, right. for instance, on, on Wonderlust, Brian does stick to Paul's original concept of the song, but he does add in some of the elements from his band, you know, that mm -hmm. great, that, you know, the great backing vocalist that he has in his, in his current band. And uh -huh. so there are, you know, there's so the, there are some subtle elements of the, you know, what you might call the Brian Wilson or Beach Boys sound, but it's still pretty faithful to, you know, to Paul's original concept of the song. And I think that the Willie Nelson uh, yesterday is another example of that because he, you know, he, he sings it pretty straight, but he makes it kind of his own because he's, again, using that beat-up old guitar. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think no matter how Willie Nelson would have done it, it would have sounded. I mean, I that was yeah. one of the, when I first heard the track list and heard he was going to do yesterday, I imagined it in, in my mind, and it was oh, real yeah. close to what, what he, I mean, you knew how he was going to do it, and he did it, and you wanted him to do it that way, and he did, you know, so. There are certain artists whose vocals are so distinctive and whose styles are very unique that when you're told a certain artist is covering a song, you can practically picture it. And mm -hmm. I remember, like, when James Taylor uh, covered Day Tripper, and I've always loved his version of it, but it's pretty much what I thought it would be. Because he's got his own style, his own voice, his own way of arranging, which is un unique to himself. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody else sounds like James Taylor, to me anyway. Mm -hmm. But uh, so when that happens, because of that, they kind of help to make the songs their own and their own interpretation. So right. those are the ones that, for me, are, are more worth my while. I can appreciate when an artist really copies the original because of the talent that goes into it. But if it's that close to the original, why wouldn't I prefer hearing the Beatles or hearing the solo versions? It's one thing if you're going to see a band live, if, if it's a Beatles tribute band live, and you appreciate that aspect if they've really nailed the parts. But if it's something that you're going to listen to on a regular basis, there mm -hmm. has to be a reason to listen other than, you know, it's exactly the same. It's kind of like I would never really listen to a CD of a Beatles tribute band sounding like the Beatles. Right. What's the point? <laughs> I remember there was yeah. a soundtrack to Beatlemania, you know, the Broadway show. Mm -hmm. like, why? Why on earth would you want a soundtrack, <laughs> you know, unless just as a souvenir of having seen the show, you know, because you'd rather hear the real thing. Yeah. 
you know, and even in the case of like um, the soundtrack for Sgt. Pepper with the Bee Gees in it. Now I know the movie was blasted, yeah. but it's the but the music still. If you like the Bee Gees, they have their own sound altogether. Mm-hmm. You know, so they have their own arrangements. So it could be worth your while, as well as Peter Frampton and everybody else in mm-hmm. in the soundtrack. But that's how I look at it. Anyway, um, a few things we should talk about Ralph Sal, because the reason why this project started was that um, in 2003 he was involved with a movie called The In-Laws, right? Which was with uh, Michael Douglas and Albert Brooks, and he was able to get Paul to uh, submit one of his songs, one of his songs in the archives, that being A Love For You mm-hmm. from the Ram Sessions, and that led to a relationship with him where he asked him if, uh, if he wouldn't mind if he put together a tribute album. So that's where this whole thing started, but Ralph Sahl has a, a long history now of doing a lot of work as a songwriter and as a producer mm-hmm. and a uh, music supervisor. He's involved with a lot of films and TV work. And he also put together a couple of other tribute albums, one for the Grateful Dead mm-hmm. called Deadology. Uh, and dedicated. Was... dedicated. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. dedicated. And there was one for the Eagles right. as well. Common thread. Right. So he has this history, and, and I know that uh, certainly the Eagles one was very successful. Yes. So, um, yeah, so he's continuing along those lines with this one. Although this is a, a much bigger project than either the the Dead or Eagles project, uh, uh-huh. because this is really the first time that there's been this kind of like an all-star. I was surprised, because when I, when I was doing the research before I did the review for Beatle Fan, I, I discovered that really there have only been a few McCartney tribute albums, and most of them have, have been primarily done by uh, indie indie bands. There was one out of Atlanta... Uh, you know, one entire album of, uh, you know, an Atlanta tribute to, to Paul McCartney. There were also mm-hmm. four, uh, within the last, uh, I think since 2001, there have been four tribute albums that were basically, that came out as charity albums with proceeds going to combat, you know, breast cancer. Right. Those uh, are the ones that are called Let Us In. Yes. Yes. Yeah, There's one exactly. called Let Us In Nashville. and. Right. There's one called Let Us In Americana. Right. And so you got a lot of people on the Nashville one that are all country artists, so you got a mm-hmm. country arrangement. And, you know, I happen to like that a lot. Sure. And as a matter of fact, because of the work that I do with my Beatles radio programs, I'm always looking for cover versions. Mm-hmm. So um, I investigate these things. Maybe, I'm not sure if the, the album you were talking about from 2001, there was one that I often use on the air. Uh, called Listen to What the Man Said. Yes. And it was mainly independent artists. Mm-hmm. Well, independent at that time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, people like Matthew Sweet right. was on that. Uh, mm-hmm. Robin Hitchcock, World Party, certainly not independent at that moment, you know, because yeah. they already had 10, 15 mm-hmm. years of recording anyway. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, I like all these different arrangements, and I go to those albums quite often. Because um, I really think it adds something to a Beatles show when you hear different interpretations of the songs. And one of the things that I didn't say early on when I was talking about cover versions is that, you know, I always remember something that George Martin said, which is one, one of the things that has stuck in my brain for many years. It's a very simple statement, which is that the genius of the Beatles lay in their songs. So the songs really have a life of their own. And so to me, when you have different interpretations and different arrangements from different genres of music of a catalog, and there have been hundreds, thousands of covers of Beatles songs, that tells you how great the songs are, because mm-hmm. you can have so many different interpretations of those songs. And so I'm really glad whenever there's any solo collection, although this is Beatles and solo, but when um, there is attention given to some of the solo music, I totally support it even though I'm not thrilled with some of these arrangements, you know, just the fact that these songs are being acknowledged. Right. But, um, you know, that's a whole other world now, cover versions. There are fans, like I said, who have absolutely no interest in it. What's the point of listening when it can never compare it to the originals? And I understand that mentality because I had that growing up as a kid. But I've since looked at things much differently, and I really appreciate when artists put their own arrangements behind the songs. I think in some ways... It may take more work to do that than to try and copy the originals. So, uh, and if you're lucky, 
and you've got a voice like like a Smokey Robinson, you know, or Willie Nelson. They're mm-hmm. so distinctive that it stands out so much that it kind of they put their own flavor on it just from their vocals alone. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and I I really enjoy more than ever listening to cover versions. So anytime there's one like this out there, despite the fact that it really has its shortcomings, and like I said, I I I do like Paul's band a lot. You know, it would be very interesting. If Paul's band actually, and I know this probably won't even happen, it might be interesting that Paul's band actually recorded an album of McCartney songs. Because you've got Rusty Anderson, who's made a few albums anyway. He sings lead. Brian Ray sings lead. Abe Laboreal actually is a very good singer. He's a very Mm -hmm. good harmony singer, too. It would be interesting to hear them do Paul's songs without having Paul's interference. (laughs) And without it being strictly the McCartney arrangement, if they wanted to do their own thing, maybe do something a little bit different. I'd prefer that than to see them back up all these other people where these other artists really have no or very little say as to how the songs turn out. Yeah, because really they were, they, were, they were just going in and just laying down their, uh, their vocals. Uh, curious to see what you guys thought of the, um, the version by The Cure of uh, Hello Goodbye, which had James McCartney on there playing keyboards. I mean, that was one of the first, in fact, I think that was the first track they previewed, and I wasn't real, I'm not a big Cure fan, so I can't, that uh, angle didn't really interest me. I didn't think it was that good, I, I just, I kind of, maybe because it was, it was the Cure, I just didn't, it didn't grab me uh, that much. Yeah, that was kind of my reaction, too, to that be was, honest. It, it's funny. I have I have a uh, a friend who's um, actually a conductor, but is, is a huge Beatles fan. And the first time I heard the Cure thing is right when they when they started promoting that clip. He emailed it to me and wrote only, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in. Um, you know what Ken was saying before about um, uh, the idea of Paul's band doing a McCartney cover album and perhaps abandoning the McCartney arrangements and doing their own thing with the stuff, I'd actually take that a little bit further and say that um, sometimes I kind of wish McCartney would abandon the McCartney arrangements and do his own thing. Um, you know, if you listen to, okay, I, I wouldn't go as far as, say, Dylan. You know, you go hear a Dylan concert now, and he might play Blowing in the Wind, and it would take <laughs> you a few minutes to even know that he's really singing Blowing in right. the Wind. The arrangement is so wildly different from any of the previous arrangements. So I'm not saying go that far, but, you know, there's something about McCartney's shows. I mean, there are obviously two approaches to giving a show, and McCartney takes the one where it should be the same or pretty much the same every night. I think these days he switches the first song uh, between shows. But, you know, it, it, it's the same every night. The stories between the songs are the same every night. And... It's, I, I find that a little dispiriting. You know, if you listen to Hendrix bootlegs, for instance, the guy could give two shows in a night and they would be completely different set lists and even the songs that were on both set lists would be played in a completely different way. Recognizable, not like what like Dylan does, but, um, you know, there's, there's a sense of the stuff being alive and changeable. And if anybody has... You know, forget about the right. I mean, really, anybody has the right to to make their own arrangement. But you kind of think that, you know, McCartney must have different ideas about these songs. It it can't be that calcified. And I kind of wish that he would sometimes come out and do completely different arrangements of some of these things. Yeah, I I agree. But I I think that Paul is probably very self-conscious about his image. And... um, you know, I think that he's giving the kind of concert that he believes his audience wants to see. And just like Steve and I have talked in many of our shows about how I wish that he would go deeper into his solo catalog and do something that was more widespread, you know, through the decades, I think he's he's come to terms with the fact that he's so well known for having been in the Beatles. Mm-hmm. And if he also wants to attract a stadium-sized crowd, he's going to have to cater to what he believes they want to hear. So, um, and then I also think he feels that the audience wants to hear the songs the way they grew up listening to them without any variation, which is a shame 
Because I think one of the most fascinating things would be if somebody like McCartney would actually do a concert and do it the way he wants to do it without any regard for the audience. What would that be? <laughs> mm. You know, if he would pick whatever material he wants to do, and it could be the most obscure things, you know, it could be Beatles, it could be, you know, pre-Beatles, it could be whatever he wants it to be, what would that be? I'd be very fascinated if he just did, oh, come on, he's earned the right to do this after all these years. So many artists who have achieved less than him are, have done that. So, you know, I, I would really love to see Paul do that kind of thing, but I think he wants to be, you know, so much mass appeal and please everybody, whether it's 40,000 people, 50,000 people that come to see him. In order to do that, he's got to play songs that he feels everybody knows, and he's got to do them the way that, that they know the songs. And in the few... Can he yes. seriously believe that if he changes the arrangements around, does something new and fresh with them, that the 40,000 people are not going to come? No, I don't know if they'd be crazy about different arrangements. I mean, there's a couple that come to mind when he did P.S. Love Me Do. <laughs> mm, yeah. Uh, most people that I know can't stand that recording, yeah. and they don't like that arrangement. They'd probably prefer, you know, he'd do P.S. I Love You the way the Beatles did it. And Love Me Do the way the Beatles did it. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you one thing that I found interesting, and maybe it's more of a novelty than anything else, but back in um, uh, when Off the Ground came out and he did um, the show, he did a show at the Ed Sullivan Theater, the Up Close uh, mm -hmm. shows, he did a version of Can't Buy Me Love, which was like a hillbilly type version of it. And I thought it really worked, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. But Can't Buy Me Love is so ingrained a certain way in our brains. I think if he was to do something like that in front of 40,000 people or 50,000, they'd be saying, what is he doing? <laughs> well, when he yep. did the uh, the Unplugged show, the, the MTV Unplugged show in 91, um, yep. and, you know, obviously there were a lot of songs that uh, that he performed uh, in in that show that, you know, he had never done before. Right, you know both both Beatles songs and you know and older older things, and in fact, uh, if you remember on that the, the 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 tour that followed off the ground, they did kind of an unplugged uh, set, and I seem to recall a lot of people heading for the beer lines during that. So maybe huh. that yeah, it's, it just, just, just seems that the, especially now with them playing stadiums and places like that where the show is this you know this mega spectacular, that I think he feels you know because of the fact that he's doing stadiums and all, he just feels and the show is kind of a spectacular that he feels that it's he's got to do Beatles songs. The, the majority of songs have to be Beatles songs. And that, you know, that he has to do, he absolutely has to do Yesterday, he has to do Let It Be, he has to do Long and Winding Road. Yeah, that those four songs he absolutely has to do, you know, no question about it, or else, you know, the person that's seeing him for the first time, and, you know, and there are a lot of those that with every show, you know, are going to leave disappointed. I think that's his 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 attitude, and that that also all of those little bits that he does between the songs about uh, let me drink in the crowd and mm -hmm. taking the taking the jacket off and the whole thing. I think he feels he's doing a show, mm -hmm. and that you know that you know just like just like on Broadway, you know mm -hmm. if you know if you go to see a Broadway show. You're seeing, you know, you're seeing actors doing the same lines every night. Or if you go to see a, uh, you know, a cabaret show, the the artist is generally doing the same routine all the time. So, I, so I think Paul is taking the kind of the traditional showbiz, you know, theorem that way in that saying, you know, this is a show. And I'm doing this for not only the the people that are seeing me for the 150th time, like Bob Gannon, <laughs> but mm -hmm. for for the people who are seeing me for the first time. Yeah, I mean it's kind of like the Beach Boys, where although I wouldn't go that far, but I mean he feels like he's got to do the hits, and that's oh, yeah. you know, 
that's the way it is. So, and uh, I, he won't he won't go deep into the into the catalog, uh, you know, the Beach Boys song either. But um, you know, you got to. You got you got to stay with the familiar songs. Sure, I mean, just the Beach Boys did go through a period where they went deep into their catalog and did uh, you know songs that they felt were more relevant, and they were playing uh, you know two and three thousand seat theaters, and it was as soon as Mike Love basically took over the uh, you know kind of the reins and said we're doing you know we're doing the hits you know especially mm-hmm. after after Endless Summer was a number one album. Uh, right. You know, and they decided to just do the hits. They're playing stadiums. Right. Well, right. they did that. They did that during the reunion, during the 50th anniversary yeah. tour, and then they, as soon as that was over, boom. Yep. Back to the old formula. Exactly. Yeah, so. Well, yeah, I thought it was interesting what Al said about the uh, the Broadway performance aspect and it being the same night after night. And I think that McCartney definitely thinks of it that way specifically. Um, I mean, partly because he, it's the era he comes from, that sort of, you know, British musical, you know, that, that mm-hmm. is part of his childhood and part of what he grew up thinking of as show business. Um, but I also asked him once, um, you know, why is it that night after night you say the same things? And this was, and this was after the 1989 tour. And so the thing that I focused on in my question was, you know, every night you introduce Linda as Gertrude Higgins, you know. Mm-hmm. And and it's interesting because you know it, this is not by accident and not just something he slipped into. He said, you know, in that case, I introduce her as Gertrude Higgins because if I introduce her as my life wife Linda, there is always going to be some wag out there who will shout something, and I yeah. don't want, you know. So uh, it's 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 interesting. I mean, like I say, I, I'd rather he loosened up a bit, but. The fact is, um, the non-loose version of it is very well thought out. He's, he, he does what he does because he he has reasons, you know. And if you ask him, he'll tell you. Most people don't ask him. That's the problem. And he was, he was that way. He was that way in the Beatles. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Putting yeah. his his hands together like a pillow at the end and saying he had to go. <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah, he was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we can certainly have a discussion about Paul live and uh, what he should do or what he shouldn't do. It's very easy for us to be critical because we're familiar with his full catalog. And if if you're like us, you probably want the whole world to be familiar with his body of work or most of it. And it's kind of frustrating when you only hear a very small percentage of it. And um, still, you know, you could say Paul is in control of everything that he does. He could actually do a tour of smaller venues and go deeper into his catalog if he wants to, but he's chosen right. to go the route of uh, the big venues, the stadiums, and he's probably doing that because he realizes that there's so many people around the world that still want to see him that have either never seen him or have rarely seen him, and those people probably want to hear the more familiar songs. So he's trying to accommodate as many people as he can, but for the people like us who really know thoroughly the album cuts, all he's done in his solo career, and there's so many, there's so many songs you could point to and say, God, that's one of his best songs. He's never done that one live. Sure. How many times can you say that? But um, yeah, but he realizes, am I going to play uh, Little Lamb Dragonfly or am I going to play Let It Be? Mm-hmm. What's well, going to get the greatest? You know, it, yeah. that's just the way that it is, and that's that's yeah. reality. But you know, it would be in a perfect world. He'd be playing every single day. <laughs> mm-hmm. he'd, he'd be playing small clubs, and he'd be playing whatever he wants, and there'd be live versions of so much more of his material uh, that we can appreciate, because so much of that stuff we'd love to hear live. Oh, sure. Right. Well, just on, on this album alone, on the, the, the Art of McCartney, you know, there's, what, 40, 40, total 42 songs, and that's just like a small fraction of the man's catalog. Right. Right. You know, you've got over 30 albums from him in his solo career, plus you've got all the great Beatles stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, and with the Beatles, you know, apart from the ones that he sang lead to, he can he can get away with doing a John song here or oh. a George song there. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there's no harm in that. It's endless, plus there's no harm in doing covers, which he rarely ever does. Mm, you know, right. he, he did it during Unplugged, which was nice to... To, to hear him do a lot of 50s stuff because he's exactly. so comfortable with it. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, it's endless what he could do. 
And in a shame, what he does in, in concert, it's a great crowd pleaser. You know, if I was 15 years old, just getting into the Beatles right now, I'd be thrilled beyond comparison with what the man gives you on stage. But mm -hmm. for the people who have fully studied his work, you know, it's a very small percentage, like you said, Al, of what he does, of what his uh, total output is, of what he does live. You know, I, I think one thing about about the um, art of McCartney that, that occurred to me when I was listening to it was it would have been really great if he had contributed to a couple of the songs on the album, maybe just picked a couple. And I know that would have made them stand out and would have, you know, it would have, uh, they would have obviously hung out there because he was on them. But even if he had been on there and, and nobody knew and, and they came out later and said, actually, he's on a couple of tracks and we're not going to tell you which ones, I think that would have that would have helped out a lot. I, I, I do. Um, and with some of the arrangements, it almost sounds like he is on there. And but it, it would have been. I think it would have been interesting if he had been on this album somewhere. Yeah, but, well, it's kind of like I, well, like I was saying about some of those, you know, the the uh, the basic tracks that his band laid down. I was half expecting to hear Paul's voice, mm -hmm. and I'd be hearing, you know, mm -hmm. Nancy Wilson instead. You know, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. No, I yeah, I agree. I agree, and yeah. So who knows? Anyway. All right, so Steve gave a grade earlier of what was it C C plus was it? I said C, I think I said C. I think okay. I said C. So why don't you guys give a grade to the art of McCartney? How about you, Al? I think overall I'd give it yeah I think I'd give it a, a I'd give it a C because there are you know there are enough um, enough tracks on there that uh, that are kind of mysteries in that, you know, some of those mystery pairings and, and some others that just aren't executed all that well. The good stuff is very good. You know, so the Smokey Robinson, Brian Wilson tracks are, are great. Uh, some of the others are, are, are wonderful, but there's too many that are really just nothing. So I'll give it a C. It's funny how we're both saying Smokey Robinson and Brian Wilson. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, those are the two gems. Yeah. Alan, how about you? I've got to give it a C as well. I, I, I can't um, I can't be any more generous than that. I'm afraid because um, while there are some great things that would be an A or even an A plus, they're balanced out by um, a number of things that would also be an F. So uh, a C is like right in the middle there, and that's I think about what it deserves. Okay, I'd probably give it a C plus, <laughs> and uh, just because of the uh, covers that I like a lot. The ones that we mentioned, Smokey Robinson, Brian Wilson, the Airborne Toxic Event. Mm -hmm. Hey, well, this is, this will be a boost to their uh, career. I was talking about them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, sure. You know, there's, there's there's quite a lot here that I do like, and and contrary to you, Al, I I do like um, Doctor John's Let Him In a lot. Um, I think it really fits him very well. That particular song. Mm. Just like I said before, certain songs. I'm glad anybody. Anybody is covering Helen Wheels. <laughs> Just the oh, fact sure. that anyone's doing a song like that, which really is a great rocker, which you don't really hear on the radio that much anymore, if at all. The fact that anyone's acknowledging a song like that, or a Venus and Mars rock show, uh, Let Me Roll It from Paul Rogers. Paul Rogers is one of the great singers in rock. It's not that different from the McCartney Live version, obviously. Right. But, um, you know, giving, giving uh, a nod to these songs that really deserve to get some attention and, uh, you know, I, I like it for that reason. And it's still a little, you know, it, it's, it's nice to have a change of pace to hear different versions of McCartney songs, although it does suffer when it's the exact same arrangements as what Paul does live with, with mm -hmm. Paul's backing band. So I think we pretty much are in agreement that it deserves a C, or in my case, a C plus, but mm -hmm. there is our you know, review of it. You know yeah. what George Martin always says about the White Album? It doesn't always, maybe, but it has said about the White Album that it would have made a spectacular single album. I uh -huh. think this made a, a spectacular 15-track CD. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're probably right about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, all, I think we'd all pick the same songs, too. That's right. Pretty, pretty much. Mm. Yeah. They could have released the rest of them as bootlegs, and we'd have all been really excited about it because the bootlegs. You know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and we would have, and we would have bought them all too. That's true. 
All right, so that puts a wrap on this show. If you would like to get in touch with us, our email address is things we said today radio show at gmail dot com. Uh, we do have a Facebook page for things we said today. So if you want to get in touch with any any of the four of us here for the show, feel free to write to us there. Is there anything any of us would like to plug? I just did uh, just did a review of the Art of McCartney, but that'll that won't be in in print until. Uh, it'll probably be in the next issue of Beetle Fan, which will be out, uh, I think, in late December. Okay. But uh, mm-hmm. but now nothing um, uh, nothing specific, other than changing times. 101 days of changing the generation. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. All right. So for things we said today, this is Ken Michaels thanking all of you for listening, and I'll see you next time. This is Steve Marinucci. Take care, everyone. It's Alan Cozen saying, see you around. This is Al Sussman saying, we'll see you next time as he raises the, the Hoffner base. <laughs> 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 <laughs>